Hi folks, uh, my name is Tim Pine, as uh, Chris said, and uh, I'm from the UC Berkeley Office of Environment, Health and Safety. And uh, Strawberry Creek is my baby. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about some of the things uh, that we're looking to do to restore the creek, uh, both its habitat and its function, and give you a little bit of history about the, the campus and how it interacts with the creek. Um, down here uh, at the bottom of campus, we are uh, just about the spot where the creek leaves campus and re-enters a culvert that goes under the streets of Berkeley. But one of the, uh, the really wonderful things about UC Berkeley is we have access to uh, a very long uh, reach of daylighted creek where people can interact with it, um, play with it, and see all the various uh, organisms that uh, that call it its home. Um, this grove that we're standing in is uh, dominated by coast redwood trees. Uh, one thing a lot of people don't realize is that the redwood trees here on campus aren't endemic to the campus. They were planted pretty close to the beginning of the campus history back in the late 1800s because by that time uh, redwood trees are, were already characteristic for their loss in the Bay Area. And so the campus founders felt that what better place than um, the uh, UC Berkeley campus to have some redwoods restored. Um, and that's great, uh, they're beautiful. They're doing pretty well because their roots are down here in the creek uh, influence. So the only problem is when you plant redwoods on a campus like this, they tend to become the dominant tree species. And so historically, before the redwoods were here, what you would have seen was what we call Oak Bay woodland. And while we still have a lot of California uh, coast live oaks and quite a few bay trees, um, where you're on the creek where the redwoods dominate, that's pretty much all you have. Um, and so as we walk along campus here, I'll point out a little bit of some of these other trees and some of these other species. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of the restoration program on the campus. It's largely a student initiative. And uh, I'm very proud to say that I've been the uh, staff advisor to those students for about the last 20 years. Chris, are we going to move? No? Nope. Okay. So in that case, um, let me tell you a little bit about um, the watershed. Uh, this creek is fed by a number of what we call seep springs. And um, what I mean by that is we don't have these kind of dramatic artesian sources where you might imagine water bubbling out of the ground or cascading down the face of a rock. A seep spring is just what it sounds like. It's just a wet spot up in the upper canyon. Uh, one of the other wonderful things about UC Berkeley is we have hiking trails that go all the way up into the upper watershed. And um, when you get up into the upper watershed, you can see some of these wetted areas. They're characteristic because they have a lot of willow growth. And so that's a plant species that you would see where you have a lot of um, wet or, or muddy ground. All these little seep springs start to come together and form these little channels. And then as the channels become one, they start to flow. And then what we're seeing down here on the bottom of the watershed here at uh, Oxford Street is the culmination of a lot of these springs all coming together. And so we call this channel um, the main stem of Strawberry Creek. There's two uh, forks to Strawberry Creek. There's the uh, North Fork and the South Fork. The, the South Fork is the one that most people are familiar with when they're hiking up in the canyon. The North Fork actually starts um, on the grounds of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and then flows down through the north side of Berkeley. And then, um, and then uh, as it flows through city streets, unfortunately, it picks up um, a few pollutants that you might see in an urban area. Um, that's one of the studies that, that students often do here on campus is compare the water quality between the North Fork and the South Fork. And in general, the water quality in the South Fork is better because it flows through a more natural upper watershed, whereas the North Fork goes through an urban part of, uh, of Berkeley. But all that said, the creek is a very viable habitat. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, we were able to reintroduce native fish to Strawberry Creek after their absence for many decades due to pollutants. And the three fish that you typically would find in Strawberry Creek now would be the California roach minnow, the three-spined stickleback and the Sacramento sucker. And all of those fish would have been historically here uh, before European influence uh, and the pollutants that came with a lot of that, um, unfortunately uh, made them uh, somewhat absent. 
So I have a couple of things I can tell you about the creek here. Um, we have been, since about uh, 1991, 92, started to remove invasive species from the natural areas on campus. Ivy became very dominant. Um, it's kind of a creeping carpet and it tends to smother anything else that would otherwise grow here. And what we've been doing for the last uh, 20 years or so is removing that ivy and other invasives and then bringing back in a native plant palette. And why we do that is because the, um, the plant palette really is like setting the table. It's, it's the food web really flows upward from the number of plants and the type of plants. And so we bring back native uh, flowering plants for pollinators such as uh, bees and butterflies. And then they're followed by birds that uh, prefer certain types of insects and then so on and so forth. And so now uh, here in the 21st century, I'm happy to say that we've got plants back now on campus that were gone for many, many years because of the influence of introduced plants like ivy and periwinkle and things like that. On top of that, um, we're also doing some tree planting to try to restore some of the lost species that not just uh, California uh, coast live oaks and bay trees, as I said, but we're also bringing back in uh, buckeyes. There's one behind me here that I planted 20 years ago from a seed when I first started working here at Cal. Um, as well as trees like big leaf maple, box elder, um, even some willow back down here on campus where we can. Uh, so that's a, a really wonderful part of the restoration program. And then last but not least, um, it allows the students here to really engage uh, with the environment in a way that they maybe hadn't been able to uh, wherever they come from. This is an opportunity for many of these students for the first time to get their hands in the soil and to experience um, the joy of planting plants and then watching them take off and grow and become part of the, uh, the ecosystem here. Anything else? Salmon. salmon. Oh yeah, so let's talk about that. Uh, the, that beautiful poem about salmon um, does bring to mind uh, kind of some of the history here. Um, this creek, uh, we know from history that it probably did have uh, runs of anadromous fish. Anadromous means a fish that um, is born or hatched in freshwater and then goes out to the ocean where it grows and matures and then comes back to freshwater. Um, it's very likely that in its time, uh, the native peoples here relied on this creek as they did many other creeks in the East Bay um, as, a, as fishing for, as a food source. And so we probably did have, um, you know, in, in the last thousand years or so, pretty viable runs of uh, coho salmon as well as um, steelhead trout. Uh, steelhead is just a rainbow trout that has managed to uh, incorporate um, the ocean in its life cycle. Uh, the last recorded um, uh, catch of a steelhead trout in Strawberry Creek, we believe, is around um, you know, 1920, 1930. Uh, I think there's some, some uh, information about that in the Bancroft archives. But unfortunately, um, those runs of anadromous fish disappeared once the creek started being um, put into culverts and, and uh, was buried under streets. Um, one thing that's interesting to note about Berkeley and the history is one of the very first efforts uh, anywhere, uh, certainly in the United States, to daylight a creek that was in a culvert happened right here in the city of Berkeley. And um, even though campus has the largest section of daylight at Strawberry Creek, there's a park down in the middle of Berkeley called Strawberry Creek Park, which was actually a former culvert that was um, broken apart and the creek was reestablished for people to come and enjoy. Um, can we ever bring back trout or steelhead to Strawberry Creek? I, I would sure love it, but that would require uh, a tremendous amount of resources and agreement in order to do that. Um, philosophically, I feel like there are other uh, watersheds within the Bay Area that probably are better candidates for doing that. But um, I feel very proud that the campus has, um, has uh, found the resources to, to uh, get the camp, the creek back to where it is now. And by reintroducing those native fish, we at least have a semblance of the fishery that was here uh, before. And it's really a joy to be able to see those fish uh, in Strawberry Creek. I'm also happy to say that the water quality in Strawberry Creek has never been better for about a hundred years. And that's also due to the hard work of uh, not just volunteers, but laws that require cities and property owners to uh, pay attention to what's going into the stormwater. 
and um, the water quality is actually quite good. Uh, there's even days when you come out here and take a test and it's getting really close uh, to that drinking water standard. That said, I'm not advising anyone <laughs> to drink it necessarily, but certainly uh, come out here and enjoy uh, the fruits of all of that uh, volunteer effort and all those laws that Californians vote into place. Cool. You guys have any other questions about uh, the creek while I'm out here? I just forget all the things that, uh, that are really impressive here. Well, just so, so you, there wasn't Chinook here? You think it would have been cold? Is that because of a smaller fish? That you know, that's a good question. In terms of the actual species of salmon that would have been here, it, it, it's hard to tell. I've, I've never seen any, um, any specific data. It's certainly possible that we had Chinook here. In fact, they were probably more numerous. Um, so I would guess that probably a, would be a good educated guess that that was part of that, that run. Um, it's hard to also know because um, the fish that are being brought back in the East Bay, I'm, try, I'm thinking, uh, trying to think of the name of the, there was a very large watershed in the South um, East Bay, um, and I believe it's Chinook that they're bringing back. So you see, Chinook are, they're, they're tolerant of a little more pollution and, and turbidity and that sort of thing, which coho are, are more sensitive to. Excellent, good to know. Um, what is that? We were talking about uh, when there were salmon coming up and down Strawberry Creek, what was the likelihood if they were one species or another? And it sounds like the consensus is that Chinook would have been more likely here than coho salmon. Although Chinook are bigger. So this is a relatively small, so maybe coho. Yep. And one of, the, one of the really interesting things I think about is that um, both, both, uh, both the, uh, the uh, uh, steelhead trout and both the Chinook and the coho are in the same genus. You know, and I, I mean, I grew up thinking like, well, trout, that's really something different from a salmon, but actually steelhead trout and both Chinook and coho are, are in the same genus Oncorhynchus. I think I'm getting that close to right. Anyway. You know, because, and they're both Andromedas. Um, and uh, the way I've heard it more uh, uh, phrased is that a, a steelhead trout that is landlocked is a rainbow trout. But okay, rather than the opposite. Rather, rather than that the opposite. Sense. I can see that. I can see that. First of all, I wanted to show you this is the. Uh, 25th anniversary of the Watershed Poetry Festival. And if you go to poetryflash.org and click on the watershed banner for a complete details and schedule of what's going to happen today as well as tomorrow, we want you to be aware of that so that you can uh, tune in and, and catch all of the activities for the Watershed uh, Poetry uh, Festival we're having today. My name is Chris Olander. I'm your host for the day somewhat of a host. I'm kind of leading this along, but uh, the poets and Tim are actually the ones who are really gonna give us the information about what's going on here. I'll be reading some poems in a little bit in the Eucalyptus Grove with a dancer. Again, we're gonna uh, move on over to the, uh, move on over to the uh, confluence at the uh, North Fork and the South Fork. And next coming up will be Lucille Langday. She'll be reading some poems for you. And we're all masked up and ready to go here, having a good time. So thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you in a few minutes from now. Thank you very much. Okay, are you ready for me to read? Yes. Okay, terrific. Well, um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be taking event. Um, all of the poems I'm going to read have a creek or a river in them. The first one is called Sossel Creek, 1954. In 1954, I was six years old and Sossel Creek was one of my favorite places in the whole world. 
I danced on the slanted cellar roof to make it rattle. And when Uncle Dick yelled stop, I climbed the fence and ran toward the creek, cutting through backyards and hiding between houses. Geronimo, he called, following with long strides, come back. I slid down the bank, grabbing at twigs and horsetails, and crossed quickly, balancing on stones, one foot on the trunk of my favorite oak. I pulled myself up into scaly branches as Uncle Dick, hands on hips, approached the creek. That child's a wild one, he said, shaking his head. I bit my lip to hold back laughter, my breath soft as the wing beats of insects that scurred the near leaves. Slender, luminous blue bodies darted from my palm, impossible to catch, and disappeared. And my next poem is called The Sick Tree. A redwood tree, more than 100 years old, suffers with Botryospheria fungus in my backyard. Some of its branches turning golden brown. The tree doctor says, keep pruning them, water the tree with a soaker hose. It isn't happy here in my yard, watching over the camellias, rhododendron, scotch moss, and blue star creeper. Even the giant sequoia is not the right company. There's not enough fog and the sounds are all wrong. Neighbors' dogs, an occasional helicopter, the rush of traffic. It would rather be in a forest not far from a creek but Pleasant Valley Creek no longer meanders, languorous as a snake. It's stuck in a conduit beneath Grand Avenue. The tree yearns for water and light, the way a woman yearns for a lover. It quivers in wind, but the city air can't soothe it. My breath is a kiss of moisture, insufficient as a bite for the starving, a penny for the homeless a mere wish for rain. And my next poem is called Muir Woods at Night. Rust colored ladybugs clustered like grapes, mate on horse tails that wave by a creek where silvery salmon spawn and leap when the sandbar breaks at the gate to the sea. The ladybugs have come hundreds of miles from valley to coast for this single's bash. The females are choosy. They twiddle the males, seeking appendages padded with fat. And all around, high in redwood burls, on elk clover leaves and in the rich soil, the meaning of life is to stroke and prod under a humpbacked moon dissolving in fog. And next, um, I'll read about the photographer on Dana Fork. This is a poem dedicated to photographer Charles Moore. The lusty Tuolumne leaps over boulders dappled with lichen. A moth dips above this rush from the snow caps. A photographer huddles under a black cloth that flaps behind his camera, a square box poised on a tripod on a granite plinth. Still heavy with snow, the far bank slopes to the river which hurries forward, then folds back on itself in a sudden burst of foam. The photographer in khaki jacket is unhappy. He'd prefer a sky ravaged by clouds, scowls at a blue expanse, so bland, sedate. Glasses on forehead, he squints upstream. Methodically, he chooses the perfect moment to preserve for a season he hopes will bring a willow to blow him over, unpredictable snow, a wilder kiss. And the next poem will take us farther from home. Uh, it's called Avon Calling in the Amazon. Whoa. 
When the fog lifts, the river is full of tiny eyes scanning the surface like submarine periscopes. Four-eyed fish seek floating insects. Close-packed trees along the bank silently compete for light. Lianas thick as wrists run from canopy to ground and back again, creeping everywhere, weaving the forest together. Moths the size of human faces swoop in shadows, but no howler monkeys call from tree to tree. Stillness permeates midday heat, except for the putt putt of the Avon lady's boat with its cargo of single stroke, one coat nail enamel, pearls and lace cologne spray, Cosba bath and shower gelée. She has eaten so many Hershey bars, her two front teeth have decayed and fallen out. She has washed her braids today with Avon Plus shampoo and splashed bubble bath in the river. Her clients will give chickens in exchange for season, the exhilarating new fragrance with the power of the waves. And I would like to conclude with two poems from my new book, Birds of San Pancho and Other Poems of Place. The first one is called The Real Thing. And this takes place in Palo Verde National Park in Costa Rica. In a boat skimming past red and black mangroves, close packed, leaning over the briny Rio Tompisque, where crocodiles swim the scales down the middle of their backs, breaking the water's murky surface like chains of floating rocks. I think of the jungle cruise in Disneyland, my father beside me when I was eight. When the fake crocodile opened its jaws, he said, how would you like to see the real thing? I said I would and meant it, but knew I'd never go with him. He feared planes, boats, and the depths of rivers. But now I'm looking into the eyes of a live crocodile in a jungle river. Pale green marbles, the pupils vertical black slits. The crocodile regards me with no apparent interest while herons dip for fish, iguanas bask on branches overhead, and roseate spoonbills splash the sky with pink. Howler monkeys stay high in the trees, but white-faced capuchins crowd around the boat when we stop. One climbs on the roof, another poops from a limb a few feet away. It hits the water with a splash. Daddy, who put so many ideas in my head. I hope you're looking down from heaven at this monkey relieving itself beside me, then popping a big black spider into its mouth. It's the real thing. And my last poem is uh, called What Flows Into the Gulf of Mexico. Melted snow from the crests of the Rockies rushes past pinion pines, limber pines, lodgepole pines, cork bark firs, ponderosas, gathering silt as it reaches burr oaks, cottonwoods, staghorn sumacs, silver maples, passes prairie cord grass, winds through cattails, duckweed, skunk cabbage, finally to mingle in the Mississippi with water draining from 31 states where hunter-gatherers lived with bison herds for 10,000 years. Now the river carries oven cleaner, human feces, and caffeine, medical residue from hospitals and laboratories, scouring powder and soap from millions of houses, antibiotics from all the cattle ranches in the Midwest. Solvents from farm machinery plants, pesticides from corn and soybean fields, ingredients used to make plastic, enough estrogen from birth control pills to bend the genders of fish. Thousands of tons of herbicides 
fertilizers that cause algae to form massive green carpets in the Gulf, which leads to an explosion of bacteria that decompose algae and kill everything in an area the size of Massachusetts each year. All this even before 206 million gallons of oil from the deep water horizon blowout, before hundreds of thousands of gallons of oil dispersant containing chemicals that destroy red blood cells and cause cancer. It all enters the shimmering translucent bodies of arrowworms and dinoflagellates consumed by oysters, the algae scooped up and eaten by shrimp, the crabs that crush mollusks and shrimp with their chelipeds, the sea bass whose stout jaws clamp down on any smaller creature. Of course, it's in our blood and hair and fingernails. It floats in our hearts and permeates our, our brains as surely as hope or anger. It's in your body and mine, these molecules that cling like lovers to our bones. And I sincerely hope that it won't be like that for much longer. There's still hope, thank you. Here we are at the confluence of the Strawberry Creek of the South and North Fork into the Main Fork. This is the Watershed Poetry Festival, the 25th anniversary. And for a complete programming, just check on poetryflash.org and check on the banner. Click on the banner and you will get the complete details of everything that's going to happen with the Watershed Poetry Festival. My name is Chris and I am your host. And I'm going to turn this over to Kirk Lumpkin, and he's going to read you a poem. And then we'll have Tim Pine tell us about what's happening here in this area. This was written to be from the perspective of a creek. This is called Creek, I Am Always Flowing. Rain soaking in and slowly through the crevices, cracks, and folds, each feeding in their trickle that swells me into being a creek, one of the shapes that water makes. I am always flowing. I flow on while you live out your whole human lives, older than you can ever be. All day, all night, I am always flowing. I may seem to you like a hidden world, but my flow is clear and there is much to see. If you will only look, I am always flowing. But you can bend and block me with pipes, canals, and dams, and you can over pump me, but I will always come back again. You can foul me with sewage and you can poison me but in time, I will always run clean again as I am always in the process of cleansing myself. But sometimes I cannot keep up with what humans put in me. So please don't treat me like a garbage dump or like some kind of toilet. Remember, I am home to a whole riparian community of plants and animals in me and around me whose diversity is more than words and names can say. I am always flowing. But it seems you think I should only live inside of your subconscious where you put what you wish to forget you throw unwanted things in me. Empty beer bottles, random plastic, soggy labeled cans, rusting refrigerators, waterlogged mattresses, used condoms, fast food packaging, and whole cars. And though you and I are very different, we are both shapes that water makes. And don't I keep on running on, even inside of you, I am always flowing.
water is life. And I bring life to every place I touch. But many towns and cities, seems like they don't want me. Like many of the people who sleep beside me. So they fence me off and hide my presence. Or worse, condemn me to be half alive in a culverted sunless world while I am best flowing in the shade of trees and when I can sparkle in the sun and be shooting off over stone lip edges, exploding out into shining droplets and white froth, then gathering together again, dancing round boulders, sliding cool and gracefully sinuous in riffles, runs, glides, and pools. All along my length, I am always flowing. I run down deeper than you can see. And often when I seem to be dry, I keep on running on underground. But even when I do go dry, I still flow through the air like a spirit presence where this place I am shaping knows I always return. I am always flowing. I am always beginning. I am always ending. I am always becoming part of a greater body of water. I am always flowing. That was a beautiful poem and a, and a wonderful segue into um, this location that we're in right now, it, it, as, uh, as Chris said, this is the confluence of the North and South Fork behind me. It'd be hard to see because um, one of our restoration efforts was to plant the, um, the uh, very uh, critical streamside plants known as red stem dogwood. This would be an endemic plant that you would have seen along both these banks. And it provides a lot of cover um, for the channel itself, which keeps the water cool and gives a nice private place for fish to uh, do their spawning thing. Um, we're standing in the middle of what's called on campus the Grinnell Natural Area. And the, the Grinnell Natural Area is the largest of three natural areas on campus. Um, these uh, natural areas were set asides uh, that uh, were designated in 1969. Uh, 1969 was a period on campus where there was a lot of building going on and uh, a large part of the campus community, faculty, staff, and students were alarmed at the rate at which some of these buildings were going up. And they were concerned that this, this rapid build out might uh, encroach on some of the, um, the natural areas that we have here. So uh, by uh, chancellor's decree, these areas were set aside. And the mandate was to try to maintain these areas um, as remnant uh, examples of what this landscape looked like before Europeans came here. So the Grinnell area is a spot where we really started concentrating on our restoration. One thing, it's hard to really convey, but uh, for instance, this entire area that I'm standing in right now behind me, um, you see uh, there's a bay tree as I spoke a little bit, California Bay Laurel, um, the, also in, in this area. Let's take a look real quick, look, look here. This is a very, very early uh, bud breakout of a, um, California buckeye. Uh, the really neat things about the buckeyes is uh, has a unique adaptation to California's droughty um, climate. It's uh, the first tree generally to drop its leaves in a dry uh, season, and then it's one of the very first to break out in buds. Um, so you can see those little leaf leaflets coming out. Let me show you two here, right on the very end of this branch, you can see this bud that's just about to turn into leaf. So these are wonderful trees to look at. So one of the nice things about coming out here to the, uh, the Grinnell area is you get to see examples of all of these California natives that are critical to uh, a vibrant and functioning habitat. Um, let's step back over here. I just get another close up. These bay leaves um, are very, very fragrant. <laughs> it's one thing, it's not gonna come through, unfortunately, on the video, but um, these leaves uh, can be used uh, for culinary reasons. 
The only difference is that they're a little more pungent than the, than the commercially uh, harvested uh, Mediterranean Bay. But this is a beautiful smell. It's very uh, characteristic of the coastal forests that, that are endemic to this area. One thing I wanted to talk about in this area, if you take a look at this, um, the, the uh, canopy here is, this was a location that we really started working on the restoration because the ivy in this area was so dense that it had actually grown up and created a curtain and a screen up here into the canopy. And unfortunately, when you have that dense a growth of an invasive vine or, or, or plant species, this became an area where we had a kind of a, a semi-permanent homeless encampment and then the impacts to the creek uh, were unfortunately uh, very harmful. We had a lot of garbage accumulating in here. We had uh, unfortunately uh, human waste flowing into the creek. And so this was one of the first spots that, um, that uh, myself working with student volunteers started to clear the ivy out of this area. In fact, it was so, so dense in here and it had been allowed to grow so long I'm going to step over to this tree. This is a cedar, but the, the ivy had grown all the way up into the canopy of the cedar. And so one of the other um, uh, harmful impacts of things like climbing vines like ivy and, and, uh, and other non-native vines is they actually put a lot of weight on the branches high up in the canopy there. And what that does is when the uh, storms come in from the north, the uh, the weight, the extra weight on the branches causes them to break off. And so this tree was actually uh, being harmed by the ivy being up in the branches. But um, using a lot of hard work and, and actual blood, sweat and tears, we, um, we cut all this ivy back and we rolled it up from this area and opened this area up again, uh, not just uh, to allow us to put in um, a more native palette, but also for people to come in and really enjoy this because uh, several generations of Cal students, uh, unfortunately, this was a no-go zone when this was an ivy jungle. Very, very few people uh, actually enjoyed this spot. Also behind me, I'm going to kind of walk over to an area. This area behind me where you can see a little bit of fencing here was one of our more recent restoration areas. Uh, in addition to planting trees, we also have brought in uh, a number of natives that were completely covered up by the ivy. And so one of these, if you look down here, this is the native blackberry that um, would have been in this watershed. I know a lot of people are familiar with the blackberries that they pick. This is that very heavy uh, red cane that has the very large berries. This is the more delicate, this is our native blackberry that hasn't been hybridized. And this really started to come back on its own. All we had to do was remove the, um, the ivy from this area and this native blackberry started to come back in force. Also behind me, we have um, a very a critical kind of a shrub that is native to this area. This is commonly known as coyote bush, but it, um, it uh, provides a really good screen and habitat for birds. And so we've got nesting birds um, this is a, an area that they like to kind of come in and, and get into. Unfortunately, this can become a little bit uh, heavy. A lot of people, um, by the way, I just have to point out on this campus, we have a, a lot of squirrels. Um, one thing I have to say about the squirrels that are here on UC Berkeley, they're not native to the West. This was an introduced species. They're actually known as Eastern fox squirrels. And um, they're a lot better adapted to the urban environment than um, our native gray squirrel. Uh, but people love them. Uh, I, I have a little issue with them because I have a tendency to chew on our native plants. Uh, but I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to deny that they're not cute and that uh, a lot of people like them. So while this looks a little bit like a kind of a, um, a hodgepodge and a dense kind of a tangle of things, this is what this watershed would have looked like before essentially Europeans came in here and started um, in a big way, modifying the uh, plant palette here. Um, behind me also is a, it's not flowering right now because we're in the middle of winter, but this is uh, one of my favorite native plants. This is known as sticky monkey flower. And in the spring and in the summer, when it starts to put out its buds and flowers, they're beautiful orange um, flowers that are very, very important for a lot of the pollinators uh, in our area too. 
Also down here is another one of my favorite plants, which is just now bursting out. This is commonly known as bee plant. And um, again, just as it says, when this will start to flower coming up here pretty soon in the spring, very important plant for a lot of our native uh, bees, our solitary bees, of which there are many in the watershed too. This is really an example of what we're actually trying to do here in the natural areas is, is rather than the, uh, what was here before, the monoculture of ivy that was allowed to just take over this area, this really should be a very, very diverse native plant palette because that's gonna support the broadest number of other native species coming back in here. And it's really a joy to work with students and the local uh, K through 12 community as well. Many of the plants that you see behind me were actually planted by children as, long, as young as six and seven years old. So it's incredibly gratifying to be able to use the natural areas as a way to get people very young starting to engage with the environment around them and for them to understand that, that uh, a native diverse plant community is really important to supporting the very broad uh, food web that we're trying to bring back here. Um, also in this area, it's kind of hard to see, but we um, are bringing back some other trees in here. Let me see if I can find one. We can kind of walk over. In the winter time, one of the issues is a lot of these trees have lost their leaves already, but this is one of my favorite trees on campus. Uh, this is one that we planted um, about four years ago. This is a big leaf maple. And again, you can just barely start to see these buds are forming, which is about right for this time of year. And um, one of the wonderful things about big leaf maples um, is that when they're close to the creek, and we've got a couple of behind us over here, they'll drop their leaves in the fall and all of that leaf litter falling into the creek is a very important part of the food web in the aquatic environment because those leaves are broken down by lots of little insect larvae. And then those larvae in turn become food for wading birds. Um, one of the beauties of being here in the natural areas, we've got a very broad um, bird community. Um, and in the creek, we've got uh, wading birds such as um, night herons, which are really wonderful to see hunting in the creek, um, egrets, and uh, even uh, our red-shouldered hawks that uh, are resident in the eucalyptus grove behind me, they uh, will nest here and they'll actually catch small fish and, uh, and crawdads that we have in the creek too. Um, behind me, you also see um, a couple of other, we've got some redwoods here, but if you look up, I think we may actually be going here later. You can see the very dominant overstory of the eucalyptus trees. Those are not native to this area. They were actually planted here also uh, quite early on the campus history. The grove behind me is actually world famous. Um, it was originally planted as a windbreak for this area because this part of campus actually had the very first running track. And uh, if you were a, a young runner, you didn't want all the dust from the wind that comes in off the bay blowing up in your eyes. So. Those eucalyptus trees were planted um, for that very practical purpose. Unfortunately, they're so dominant as a species that not a whole heck of a lot can actually grow underneath them. And certainly it doesn't support the kind of diversity that we're standing in right now. Um, there's a lot of other plant species in this area. Um, it's actually one of the nice things about this spot is that I can bring classes here and actually uh, teach a class, not just on native plants, but also weeds sprinkled in amongst all of this is an annual growth of a lot of the weed palette that we're actually trying to control. Um, and that's just a lot of hard labor. When we're doing weed control on this campus, um, we don't use Roundup. We use hand labor and we use other hand removal methods. And so the more volunteers I can get out here that are trained in plant recognition, the more effective that effort is. And so this is the time of year when um, I try to get as many students out working with me to try to remove a lot of the stuff that otherwise would be competing with the plants that we put in here. Um, what else can I tell you about this area? While we were out here, um, we heard um, a couple of birds 
that are native to this area. I know I heard um, what sounded like a Stellar's Jay. That's one of our blue jays that would be native to this area. Uh, I heard a couple of robins. But the important thing that um, to note about the uh, those bird calls is that many of those birds wouldn't be here on campus had we not brought back um, that diversity uh, in the plant palette because the fruits of a lot of these plants, uh, not least of which the native blackberry, but some of the other fruiting plants that we have here, like the toyon um, that we put in has a beautiful red berry. These are all critical food sources for these bird uh, communities. And so when we don't have these plants on campus, we also don't have these birds. And so this is really a joy to come out here on a day like this and be able to hear the diversity of bird calls in the background as well. Chris, do you have any uh, questions? So the story on the, so that's a great question. The live oaks, I mentioned earlier that this is typically what we would call Oak Bay woodland. So if you kind of pan over here a little bit, we're standing in a grove, uh, one of the older groves on campus of these, these, uh, these trees right here behind me. These are the, the very um, essential keystone tree species in this area. That's the coast live oak. And they support a very big part of the food web here too. It's the acorns that are seasonally produced by these trees. Not only supported a broad diversity of animals, both birds and um, before the fox squirrels. The fox squirrels love them. Before the fox squirrels, the gray squirrels, but also the native peoples of this area, the Ohlone tribes really uh, were critically um, dependent on the seasonal um, acorns as well. Do we wanna go find one? Yeah, see if we can. Uh, it's, can we duck underneath this or should we just go out this way? Oh, this is kind of fun. Before we go look at for, um, for a uh, oak, I wanna show you, this is a buckeye. Um, this is the seed of uh, the, some of the trees we were just showing you. It's the largest seed um, of trees in this area and it's called a buckeye. Largest in North America. Largest in North America. Uh, I was going to say there might be like a native palm somewhere on the Gulf, but I could be wrong there. But anyway, this is a very, very large seed. But if you look behind me, this is what a um, probably a one or I would say this is a two year old a buckeye that's just growing up here. So he's just he's got the one leader, hasn't done any side branching yet. So from this, we're going to get this. And I have to say, it's very gratifying to plant these. They're one, very easy to plant. All you have to do is just simply take your corner, you know, the heel of your boot or your shoe and just set this down in there. I usually like put them on their side and then a large tap root will come out and then the, um, the main leader will start to come up from there. Interesting to note that um, even though the acorns were the preferred food for a lot of the people here, um, when uh, times were tough and the acorn harvest was not very robust, they could turn to buckeyes um, as a food source as well. Um, yeah, so, the yeah, you do. They, um, that's a good point. Um, the buckeyes are very astringent, so they needed to be processed and rinsed and rinsed and rinsed to uh, get rid of that kind of that bitterness. Um, can we look, we're looking for an acorn. Is there an acorn or a cap? Anyone want to find one? You know what the Indians used to do with those buckeyes? No, well, what did they do? Yeah, they, the yeah, they, they would uh, take the uh, buckeye, they would take the buckeyes and they would uh, peel them, peel the bark off of the, off the seed there and they would pound it and put it in the water. And it would, it's a poison actually, and it would stun the fish. And then after, oh, maybe uh, 20 minutes and they would come back and they would collect the fish out of the, out of the creek. They also, it's a very, also a hallucinogenic. I have a friend who actually did that and he ate it and he said that he probably wouldn't do it again, but it was very interesting and so I wouldn't advise it, but anyway. <laughs> Good to know. Um, so this isn't a great example. This one actually has started to rot out, but this is really uh, typical of what a, um, an acorn from these live oaks look like. It's not one of the largest acorns. Uh, there are a valley species of, a, of um, oak trees that produce a larger acorn. But um, they vary in size, but that's about typical. And then last but not least, um, 
the uh, they one of the ways they propagate. One of the ways you get more and more of these trees is um, both birds, typically jays. Uh, we have a native jay in this area called a scrub jay. Will take these and they'll cache them. They'll actually hide them in the ground, and the ones that they don't find uh, through the year when they're eating them become the uh, basis for the new. Uh, oak trees in the area. And of course, our squirrels are responsible for planting quite a few of these as well. Uh, but this is a very critical tree species um, in this watershed. And the beauty, one of the beauties of, of uh, UC Berkeley is that you can still walk around this campus and find um, oak trees that are, you know, upwards of 100 plus years old. One, okay, one, one thing I do want to say is, uh, is the oak trees on this campus, um, unfortunately, are kind of reaching the senescence. Some of them, we've lost some very large specimens on the campus. And so one of the efforts of the restoration program is to where we lose one is to put back four or five seedlings so that we can keep that succession going. Um, and uh, as much as I love the redwood trees on this campus, um, they do suppress a fair amount of the oak regrowth because their canopy is so dominant and they're so effective at um, competing with, uh, with the oaks that were here. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of the oaks we've lost this year uh, fell over because they were having to arch out away from the uh, dominant redwood canopy and that made them uh, susceptible to falling over. All right. So one thing I want to leave you with here before we leave the Grinnell area is this is a spot that if you ever get a chance to come to UC Berkeley, uh, I really encourage you to spend some time here in the Grinnell. It probably has the greatest diversity in terms of uh, bird life as well as plant species. We're going to continue to try to do the kind of restorations you see behind me. We typically, after we do a planting like this, we'll leave the fencing up for just a little while just to make sure the plants get established. But once they are established and we're about ready to take this fencing down, we really encourage people to kind of wander in and amongst and, and look closely at what you're seeing here. You know, if you, if you see a plant species that you're curious about, there's a brand new app that a lot of my students uh, really are enjoying. It's um, from iNaturalist. There's a, a version of it called Seek. You can actually use your camera and point it at the leaf and it will, there's has a very robust database. It will recognize the photo that you take of that leaf and it will tell you a lot about the plant. And it's a great way to explore this area um, because we've got a lot to see here and it's a really wonderful place to come out and experience uh, remnants of what used to be here before all of this change and all this built environment uh, went in. Here we are again. This is the watershed's 25th anniversary. And we're exploring Strawberry Creek with uh, Kirk Lumpkin, myself, Chris Olander is your host, and Tim Pine, who has uh, given us a, a great detail about what's going on here on the creek. I also want to encourage you to go to poetryflash.org and click on the banner watershed, and you will get a complete programming of the activities for today as well as tomorrow. Uh, and we're going to be moving on over to up the creek here, up the South Fork for a bit. And uh, we're going to do some more uh, poems and some more information about, uh, about um, the area here. And I really, really encourage you to come here and find out. Everyone needs to know everything about their watershed because it's vitally important. If we don't learn about our watershed, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, we're going to lose our water. It's a life-giving uh, process that keeps us going and also keeps everything else in this world going. Uh, we need to do that and really take care of our watersheds. Thank you for, um, for that, Tim. It's really, it's wonderful to learn all about these native plants and, uh, and, uh, and what, what, you're, what they're all doing over there is very exciting. Um, so I'm going to, and thank you, Joyce and Chris, for inviting me. It's wonderful to be a part of the festival this year. I'm honored. I'm going to read four poems today, and they are ekphrastic poems. So I'm going to try to share the, the uh, images with you. 
and um, their artwork, their, the poems are inspired by artwork uh, of my uncle. His name is Bahman Mohassas. He passed away in 2010. So I'll see if this is going to work. Let me try. So this first poem is uh, the poem that was published in California, Fire and Water, a climate crisis anthology that Molly Fisk edited that we all love and know so well. Um, Baird. The small phalanx has returned, bustling over dandelions. I put off mowing for a third morning and listen. The sunny flowers give, tousled under one bee, then another. By noon, they fold or go to seed. I welcome the quiet in the wake of the bees, a lapse in the drone of weed whippers clearing dry brush, chainsaws felling bone-stripped ponderosas. Near and far, we make the air pulsate, back to back from dawn till two, then again at sundown, we make room, more defensible room for fire trucks, evacuation routes. I have plenty of visibility now. The woods, a manicured park of blue oaks. Naked up to the waist, silky madronas peel before my eyes. I walk the dog, check on Toyon at the bend in the road. It came out in June, thick creamy clusters quickly wilting like a bouquet in the musty hands of an anxious bride. Now it hangs with waxy red berries dented black as tooth decay. To think Hollywood received its name from this scrub. Her spot bald boughs gracing centerpieces at Christmas. She could poultice a wound, soften thirst, Fresh or dried and ground, she would feed me as she did the Muekma Awan, the American Robin, the Mockingbird, with her poems, her leaves hesitant as a rose. She leans messy and fungus ridden over the scotch broom. I've seen them take cover at these two brambles here, the hair transfixed at their feet by the incoming headlight, the proud doe, too, the high priestess of the woods, wavers here at Toyon, the terminus, the last remaining buffer at the junction to our world. I walk back and down the driveway. Come nightfall, creatures shall shiver like stars, stare unblinking into the blackness, now bared and leveled. I keep vigil, my home lit up, loud as a blunder. This next poem is uh, in response to an event that happened some years ago in Lebanon. Lebanon has always had a waste management system that's been strained and not, not functioning. And there is a landfill outside of Beirut called Borj Hamoud. And uh, at some point they did an experiment to, 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 to sort of dump the trash into the Mediterranean in a, as a project to expand the land, kind of a land expansion project. And of course it didn't work and um, it was a disaster. And the title is a quote from an article that I used to inform my poem here. This used to be the sea. One day we looked out, we couldn't see the sea. The mountain began disappearing in truckloads. It was erected during the Civil War, axiomatic proof that wars do not cause dearth, but excess. Not exactly abundance, but sufficient dirt to add a mountain to the earth. We called it Borj Hamoud Mountain a soft yawn of sentient slumber that knew our city's intimate rhythms, a rapacious appetite and daily cleansing rituals, the shedding of leftover errors and facts as unbecoming as half-formed contaminated children and mangled steel. It crawled with long snakes and our meek beliefs in those Samaritan gestures, 
intended to add up in good time and absolve the city of dross. And refrigerators, stainless steel refrigerators that no longer preserved our dewy dreams, yet refused to thaw into the thin air of our expectations. And we carried on at the seaside, encased in our whitewashed Mediterranean walls, adorned with azure tiles, fortified illusions that couldn't keep the strident stench out. It rammed itself into rooms, felt no need to ooze beneath doors into basements. It appeared through sheer will. While we waited patiently for a change in the direction of toxic wind, we taught our children how to inhale death in smaller sips. Borj Hamoud Mountain, our communal black hole of nondescript inequity topped with dirt, a cat half covering her dump, innocent enough. Then the mountain began disappearing. A procession of trucks glowing with heavy metal, radioactive green microplastic teeming with sluggish bacteria and dripping thin juice past our doors, accompanied daily by a faithful flock of seagulls, until the mountain was expunged, though the rats remained like loyal pets, and we had reclaimed our natural land. Then one numbered day, our fishermen returned with mad talk of scaled creatures floating on the sea like slaughter of fetid screams that bubbled in pain and refused to lie down on their sides. And we awoke one unconscionable morning to find we had shoved the sea out of our way. This next one It's called shopping. Shopping. Each time I prepare a list, I forget something ineffable. The white wound of rubber trees bleeding latex. The vulnerability of roots in a baby six pack of parsley plugs, also plastic, black, and thinly negligible. The cling to life after death on the stand of fresh gills and the thrashing tail. Each time I venture out, I take thinner sips of air, weigh myself against quality on the grand scale. I buy time in aisle after bleach lid aisle, reading labels for the most cost effective way to squander. Possibilities swarm with beeswax and balsam. Cultivars and colognes each contain an entire terrain from Provence or a close semblance. I sift through my needs, sniff my wrists, smile and mutter an excuse to the salesperson for why I cannot afford the air. Even so, each time I leave hugging a package or two, I feel refurbished. Confident it will smooth over like a coat of whitewash or at least identify what is missing. Listen, who is crying? I can barely hear it anymore. This last one is called eggplants. In a sun-soaked spot in the garden, half veiled by broad purple-veined leaves, black beauties dangle, burying bare heads in the warmth of a late summer bed. Did the eggplants back home, pot-bellied and turgid, dangle different? Different from the Sicilians and the heirloom fairy tales? Remember how we stood them in rows on the kitchen counter like mothers in lines at Tehran Bazaar, wrapped from head to toe in black chadors. Yet for all their protection in yards and yards of tough patent leather sheen, back home the eggplants collapsed into a pile of slush in less than an hour in the oven. It must have to do with the loamy soil. In my palm, the petite fairy tale is far from a shade of night. It's covered in neat streaks of white light, 
like well-managed shooting stars. I suspect it has issues, refuses to yield much seed, lest it bloat and bitter, eschews color too. Watch me and learn, it says. Sweetness is promised in your name, not in the well-conditioned soil. Live up to your name, all of you. Go on, grow, be fruitful. Little fingers is more reserved. Less need be said when you are the origin of things. It's pendulous, suspended from the calyx, a drop of ink holding dark to history. Run your fingers down the bruised body to the head. Its firm flesh ends in awe. Not as in cucumbers bolting like children into lanky limbs, but the father, tender in his prime. Between Ichiban and Tycoon, between Rosa Bianca and Violetta di Firenze, between Louisiana Long Green and Thai Green, black beauty bows under the California sun, digging its roots into the red sear clay of the Sierra foothills. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy this wonderful festival. Thank you. Hello again, my name is Chris Olander. This is the 25th anniversary of the Watershed Poetry Festival. And to find out the complete schedules, check on poetryflash.org and click on the banner, Watershed, and you will have a complete listing of all the activities we're doing here. And right now we're at the Baytree Bridge and we're going to have a poem reading by Kirk Lumpkin. So I'm gonna turn that over to uh, Kirk right now. And here we go. In uh, California last year, our fire season burned about 4 million acres. And that may seem to everybody and to myself as a very large number, but those who have studied it believe that Native Americans in California burned about that many acres intentionally every year. But the character of their fires would have been very different, uh, much less intense and burning much less fuel because they burn regularly. So uh, the poem I'm gonna do is called, I am fire. I am fire. I am the dance of energy releasing in flames. I'm a shifter of shape a changer of forms, a recycler of nutrients, a composter, an elemental force of destruction, cleansing and rebirth. And just because you have matches or a lighter or other means for getting me started doesn't mean that I am your slave, servant or pet. Don't get too close to me. I can always burn you, but I am not your enemy. Though I have killed your heroes many times, that was not my intention. I have no intentions. But you humans and I have a long shared history. Some of your kind have even said it was your relationship with me that first made you fully human, that set you apart from the other animals. For countless generations beyond memory, your ancestors gathered round me for warmth, protection, cooking, and light. And for hour after hour, they stared at the ever-changing stories of my living tongues of flame, firing their imaginations long, long before 
you started staring at screens. My old partner, Lightning, first connected us. Lightning and I go way back. You might say all the way to the beginning. I have always been an important part of evolving the life of this place. All of the beings native here have adapted to me as a permanent part of the world they live in. The first peoples of this place used me for cooking and heating, much like you did. But they also worked with me in what you call nature, burning to keep meadows open, to preserve oak woodlands, to encourage the growth of plants they used, and much more including fighting fire with fire by burning around their villages to protect them. Your big problem with me in forests and other wildlands started with logging and suppressing me. Back when there were vast expanses of old growth evergreen forests, and oak woodlands. There were more large, widely spaced trees. And I came through many times, leaving behind me more benefits than damage. But now, after years of over logging and suppressing me, forests are clogged with lots of tiny, spindly trees. Then add to that longer fire seasons more frequent droughts, areas riddled with dried up trees killed by wood boring insects and invasions of highly flammable non-native grasses all leading toward more catastrophic infernos with hundred foot flames in the treetops. Suppress me too long, and you'll be sorry. This is not a threat, just the truth. When I go wild, you do not want to be there. You humans are so very smart, but you start to act like the laws of nature no longer apply to you. But I am fire and I am telling you the laws of nature still apply to you. And I have to say, Smokey the bear is a cartoon. And real bears know that I may be dangerous, but I am not evil. I am always true to my own nature, though I may act very differently in different situations. As in the wild world, I burn very differently in grasslands conifer forests, oak woodlands, chaparral, and in your human world, I have so many very different roles. I'm the heat in your wood stove, the internal combustion in your car engine, your collaborator on delicious food, the blast of a blowtorch, and the gentle pulse of a candle. But when I'm very small, it takes barely a breath to blow me out. When I'm just a little bigger, the wind moves me and spreads me and blows me up. You should know by now to beware the Diablo winds, the Santa Ana winds, hot, dry winds coming out of the east, sweeping down from the mountains, their hot breath whipping my flames, exploding through the chaparral. And when I get big enough and hot enough, now I make my own wind with whirling, flaming vortexes powerfully blowing and pyrocumulus clouds of smoke that can turn your day to night. I am fire. And if you wanna be safe in your human world, 
use me for prescribed burns or at least mimic me with thinning for one way or another, the thinning will come because I have always been here and I will always be here. But in this changing environment and this changing climate, I am changing too. Are you? So just very briefly, the um, reason why we brought you over here was to talk a little bit about, um, I don't want to call it the dark side of uh, creeks, but um, what not to do to a, uh, to a natural waterway. So ironically, the scene behind me here is frequently used in um, promotional materials that talk about the beauty of the campus. And when I look at it, I see beauty. I mean, don't get me wrong, this overstory here is actually really nice. But if you come over here to the edge and you take a look down there, you'll see that the creek bed here is actually poured concrete with a few boulders tastefully set into the concrete. And then you see here a stone wall, uh, which looks somewhat natural, but still obviously part of the built environment. And so the problem with this kind of constraint on a natural um, water course like Strawberry Creek is by funneling the water into this narrow channel, you change the function of the creek. And here I'm specifically talking about the speed of the creek. So we just had a fairly large storm come through. And because of this constraint, the level came up very quickly and the speed of the water was very, very forceful. And if you walk around here and um, I'm gonna show you this bench, some of you who are watching this who may have been Cal grads or been on the campus, you know, uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago, might remember that this was used to be called the Bay Tree Bridge or the Octagon Bridge. And coming out of the middle of this bench was a beautiful, large and quite old bay tree and the canopy a cup filled this entire area. Unfortunately, um, because of the campus desire to highlight this tree and put it, uh, right here on a bridge that channelized creek flow actually undermined the root structure on the bank that's under my feet here and caused it to start to fail and the tree started to list dangerously and then because it became a hazard we had to cut it down and so at that time after cutting it down we put these boards on top of this bench that used to have a beautiful tree coming out of it so people wouldn't fall through the hole that was created by the uh the former uh, tree. So I say that by way of illustrating that when you've got a, a creek that's under your care, the best thing you can do for it is to give it room to spread out. And humans learn again and again that, that lesson that creeks and rivers and other water courses need space to spread out in order to be healthy. And um, woe betide the person that decides to put a house or a classroom or a building or even a bridge uh, around a tree because you love it only to have it um, be responsible for its premature demise. So uh, yeah, this is a real pleasant spot here when the bay tree was here, we sat down here and had lunch here several times, but it's too bad it's, it's, it is gone. Uh, but that's what happens when you don't respect creeks, you don't respect nature, and you think you're going to hem them in, concrete them in, or build houses on floodplains. It always happens. Houses will be floating away or be filled with water, and that means lots of insurance money. And insurance costs are one of the highest priorities of expenditures for not only human beings, but also for the government and everyone else who's not paying attention to nature. Okay. Hello. Go back to the ivy. Actually, that's a really good point. Uh, I was just pointed out, um, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, earlier, when we were over in the middle of the Grinnell area, I talked a little bit about how dominant uh, certain species, non-native species can become in this watershed. And this is a good um, illustration of what ivy, this is actually Algerian ivy is what is commonly called. 
can do when it's left um, unmanaged in a natural setting. Um, in fact, we do somewhat manage the ivy over here. You, if you pan over this way, you can see the tendrils just starting to come up the, the trunk of this, um, of this um, redwood behind me. But you can see also here just at the base how dense this is and what a dominating carpet um, is. And this is essentially the kind of coverage that we attacked when we were starting back there earlier in the program when we were look at, looking at the uh, Grinnell area. We haven't really touched this area at all. Um, some students and I did a little experiment just behind me here. You can see there's a buckeye right next to this little stand of redwood trees. And we cleared it back and we actually planted some native plants in there. And then we also put some just beyond in the ivy. And the, the idea of the experiment was to see um, how long would certain species last in a dense planting like that. And I have to tell you, we did this experiment only about five, year, uh, five years ago. You, I, you'd be hard pressed to find any evidence that we put anything in there because the ivy just came back right away. Uh, so once again, that's a great illustration of what I'm talking about when you've got to think very carefully about what's being introduced into a watershed and how it functions. Why is the name of the Grinnell? Oh, so the, uh, the, that's a good question. Why is that naturally named the Grinnell? Joseph Grinnell is a well-known um, biologist in kind of the early part of uh, campus history. And the thing that I think is most valuable about his research is he was one of the very first biologists that looked at California from coast to mountains. And he did this from the top of the state all the way down through the bottom of the state. His, uh, his recorded data now is being used in uh, very many diverse ways, but most critically, we're comparing what Grinnell recorded in his transects across the state with what's still around now, especially given the pace of climate change and uh, the rapid conversion of some of these uh, critical habitats. We're seeing what survives and what's actually disappearing as a result. So. Uh, thus the Grinnell natural area. The other two natural areas, just so I should say, we have the good speed natural area that's up in the, um, up further up the South Fork. And then we have the Wixon natural area, which is over on the North Fork. My house is on the riverbed of a place where the Smith River used to flow. And the Smith River now is just a quarter mile uh, east of me. So I'm right on the Oregon, uh, California border through the redwoods east of Crescent City. And it's a beautiful area. But anyway, I'm going to be reading from a book called Being Animal. And this book celebrates the beauty of many North American animals. It grieves the loss of several species. And it also, um, I attempt to embody some of their wisdom in some of the poems. So the first poem is a little haiku called well, haikus don't have titles. So this is just a haiku. Absorb the night air, come into animal presence. Hoo hoo, hoo hoo, hoo hoo. This first poem is called Owl. And I was at the Audubon Festival in Portland, Oregon and this bird was on display and I absolutely fell in love with it. So I had to write a poem about it. The owl's eyes were so perfect, so black, so lustrous, so elliptical, that I wanted to be lost in them forever, to enter into a bird's eye view of the world, to see in the dark, be the dark, be inside out blackness. The owl's feathers were so gray, so gunmetal gray, so cold of squirrel gray, so blue gray, I wanted neither day or night to be in sheer limbo of it all, mute and silent. The owl's head swiveled from left to right like it had no vertebrae, like its head could twist off, like watching a skater whip around in circles that I wanted all my thoughts to dissolve. The owl's modeling was so white, so virginal, like a soft down of a swan, like a lamb lived in its feathers that I wanted to drift into deep sleep. The spotted owl was so beautiful, I no longer wanted to be human. I wanted to dwell in the wellspring of those eyes, to take flight in the cool night air with fringed wings, to be silent and soft feathered, to fall from a great height at will, sensing the very visible.
This next poem is called Blue Whale at Bolinas. Many of these poems occur in uh, Marin County area where I used to live. Blue Whale at Bolinas. She lay there like a behemoth tube sock, the surf rising up then crashing down on her body, no longer belonging to sea, but to sand in the hands of the biologists who will carve into her flesh for a full necropsy, broken ribs, blunt force trauma to her head, struck by a ship, wham, wrong place, wrong time. The gentlest of beasts and eater of krill became roadkill by the busyness of ships bringing in cargo from Japan. Imagine the weight of a ship barreling into a 79 foot whale. And here on Agate Beach, tiny stick figures called humans scatter around her. The waves roll in, rinsing her great blue body with sea foam, singing her spirit back to sea. This next poem is called Sea Stars. As if fallen from the sky, their five points illuminate the bottom of the sea. They have lived for centuries, blood orange, deep purple, with perfectly symmetrical arms now tearing off and crawling away from their bodies. Sea star wasting syndrome. Can you imagine what that feels like? Maybe the bombing victims of the Boston Marathon know when that blast left so many with shattered limbs, our nation severed in so many directions. The ocean now acid. Today, I found a tiny headless snake squirming on my patio. What? I look at my body still intact. I love my arms when they swoosh the summer air as I hike up Mount Burdell the balance they create, the multitude of surfaces they serve. Whole populations of sea stars along the Pacific coast vanishing like cities at night, lights going out one by one. As their arms rip away, leaving their bodies in a limp mass, I do my morning yoga, triangle pose, my body five pointed, my left arm vertical toward the sky from where stars fall. This next poem is called First Feathers. There is an ache in my bones, old as the Cretaceous. I am part dinosaur winged and reptilian, crushed fossilized, my vertebrae lodged in limestone, my tail an imprint of first feathers, a desire to fly over seas of writhing creatures that rise and snap with great jaws as I lift leap and lift off by a wingspan of invention. I am part bird, trapped in stone, asleep for a million years. This bird bears weight in my bones. She is my phylogeny, my alphabet of history, the edge of evolution. As she rises to the surface, her wings thrum in my dreams. This next poem is called Puma. I used to walk in an area um, called Rush Creek in Nevada. And every time I walked around this creek, I had a sense that the mountain lion was there, although I never saw her. And, but I wrote this poem for her anyway. Puma. Moon drop eyes, paws of steel. You who roam the hills near home. Silent, stealthy, invisible to prey until you pounce. Runner of wind of time, you traverse miles like liquid amber flashing through autumn grass. Paw prints disappearing in dust, your breath a flame, your heartbeat a compass mapping your terrain. Closest ancestor to my wildness, you prowl inside my soul, forcing me alert and to hunt any small rustle or scent that leads me toward that edge of aliveness. This next is a little haiku. After each chapter section in my book, I ended with three haiku. And this is the end of the 
shape-shifting section of my book. Lightning quick fox, I follow until I wear a plush, a plush coat of rust. And this next poem is called So Many the Numbers. I'll never forget the late fall day when we drove up to the Nooksack River, full of spawning salmon. Surprised to catch a few eagles feasting on the ground, then our eyes lifted to the tall firs where over 100 perched. Heads white as ghosts, beaks fierce as size, all feathers and talons, wingspan and visual acuity. Never had I seen so many bald eagles in one place and the vast number of salmon zeroing upstream. This is what the earth looked like 40 years ago, before cell phones, the internet, seven billion people, the melting ice caps. This was my panorama when my future was fresh and the world was full of promise. Silvery salmon, wild rivers, our na national emblem visible to the eye, the great shriek to freedom. Now my panorama is a large screen TV blaring thousands of immigrants fleeing Honduras, overheated, underfed, marching toward a militia line border in America. The eagle, only a memory overhead, freedom, a phantom cry. This next poem, uh, the next the last two poems are poems, are newer poems, but they could have gone into this book because they all are about animals too. I have to just admit that um, I was a biologist before I turned a poet, so I just always write about the natural world. This one's called A Prayer to Tatanka. It sounds, it's a very Native American feel to it. We need to hear your thunder, Tatanka, rushing over plains. You who are burly haired, curly horn, one amber eye glaring at the enemy. A great slaughter reduced your herds of millions to 1,000. Graveyard of bones piled on the plains. Tatanka, bison, the largest land mammal that survived the great migration over the Bering Land Bridge. Ancestor, beast of cloven hooves, heavy headed, he hide thick as cedar bark, grazer, source of life. Remind us of the once abundant life. Remind us of nourishment you gave freely to native tribes. Remind us of your strength for we are failing at life on earth, flailing our arms to megafires, storms, political unrest. We are succumbing to a virus that's wiped out many lives just as we tried to wipe out you. You have returned in great numbers to Tonka. Forgive us for harming you. Teach us your resilience and strength. And my last poem is called The Renewal. I was just up in Washington state. So this takes place in the waterways up there. Mounds of white cover the green. An entire field flooded with snow geese. Behind them something larger, gray sandhill cranes bent over to feed. Just north thousands of tundra swans wintering at Richfield Refuge. So exhilarating like watching the great wildebeest migration on the Serengeti. Renewal for the new year and water everywhere, filling the fields, overflowing the creeks, opposite the parched summer when uncontrollable wildfires raged. Just wait a few months and everything changes. The loss of the Sumatran rhino, the Chinese paddlefish, the death of a great writer on Christmas, a new US president, while all these avian creatures filled the air with honks, cries, and whooshes, 
the air electric with sight and sound as I watched the world change. Some things still thrive and I'm alive after six decades. So grateful I came to the field that magically turned white with the redemption of snow geese. Thank you. Hello again, my name is Chris Olander. I'm your host here. We're in the Eucalyptus Grove of the UC Berkeley campus. And I'm gonna read a couple of poems and the lovely Sharon Coleman will be dancing interpretively to these, these poems. Mm. Each day, our hands discover the blue emerald river heart, jewel that radiates the canyon's deepest image, the forest fountain, bubbling wilderness down the granite crags is building block foundation. Our souls, precious body, a sweet communion for our lips, speaking vast secrets, fate sing of spirits unfurling leaves from the gold and black oak, nourishing the lupin nectar, rippling the spring rivulets, glowing with dawn fire, we dive into its clear pool, spirit laughing, our river current, a praise poem. We rise in rivers, the Sierra winds over the blue green curved spheres, intelligence, fueling this particle universe, stardust flowing through our heart muscle, each cell of our symphonic flesh, rippling all rivers, nourishing our soul's nerve network. The brain sphere forming our ocean's flesh, who we were, who we are at this moment, still, who we become. We rise from the cosmic seas elements. We are waves rolling, whirling wild DNA strands. Strings structuring our instrument's tone. Breathing bodies of sisters and brothers, animals, Plants and trees, unfurling leaves, breathing, pulsing the body essence, existence, dancing, waves of words, kissing the shoreline stone skin, destiny's vibration the body's melodic language dancing right here, still whirling. River light in the mind, deep emerald pools, the granite canyon, we reflect what is passing through rock. Sand grinds deeper. Each year of our lives, memories flowing out of sight. So we look upstream to what is coming, entranced. Green serpentine flow, conifer, oak, poison oak mock orange and black locust sweeten the body's electric movement we watch water bubbling rolling over cobbles between bedrocks splashing beauty clear 
the rhythm character, polishing gemstone, crystal cascade lace patterns between white bone, the gold of our lives. We climb naked, warm, into Marrow's beautiful canyon, where this woman gathers her movements true to her course before her in rapid churn, roars the river's green gold light, pooling her body's treasures, battered by the brute boulders' force to the ocean's generation. Spiraling cycles encircling this world body, she becomes more beautiful each day, widening my embrace to the essential element. And so it is, we enter the jeweled pool, pleasure, wetting imagination, embracing flesh and current light, sliding over bones, rippling between boulders into crux of power coming together, frothing the cascades, roughly rush, salmon leaping upstream, coming, still quivering, flush red, the pool's last light, mirroring the bubbling cascades, cleansing desire, rippling downstream, the current swirls each day, this woman and I swimming upstream, coursing the falls as wet, light, miracle. So this is um, this location, we're actually officially back in the Grinnell area, the eucalyptus grove, um, as I mentioned before, it's, it's culturally significant because of its age here on campus. Um, it's, there's no denying it's beautiful. The, um, the canopy here uh, is, um, well, I'll, I'll say it, it's the tallest grove of eucalyptus trees in North America. Um, it was one of the very earliest plantings of uh, blue, gum, blue gum eucalyptus trees anywhere in North America. And as such, uh, we think the tallest trees here are about 210, 220 feet tall. Um, it does have a very cathedral-like feel here uh, and it's, uh, it can be quite peaceful in here as well. Two pieces of advice. Uh, if you find yourself here on campus on a windy day, stay away from the eucalyptus grove because one of the um, characteristics of these trees is that they shed large branches uh, without any warning and they come down with a lot of force and then, uh, in fact, <laughs> we got one here. This, this giant branch actually just fell as a result of this storm that we had this last week. Uh, and you certainly wouldn't want to be anywhere near that when it came down. Um, also, the, very commonly, uh, large strips of bark uh, come off these trees. This is a, a normal um, function of the uh, bark on this tree. Um, but they're not without controversy, despite their beauty and how nice they smell. Um, uh, these trees are known to be quite flammable in our region. Um, and uh, one of the characteristics of a piece of bark like this and its shape is that once uh, on fire, this can actually fly pretty high up in the air uh, on rising heat and currents and then glide down and start other fires. And so um, this grove is not in any danger of being removed by UC Berkeley. Um, but uh, some of you may know that uh, we're actively removing the rest of eucalyptus on UC Berkeley's watershed and the upper Strawberry Creek watershed um, as a result of its uh, fire characteristics. And the side benefit of um, removing that uh, fuel will be a resurgence in the Oak Bay woodland that we talked about uh, earlier. Um, however, this grove uh, will probably live out its life um, until these trees come down in storms. One thing I should also note about this tree in Northern California, this tree grows a lot faster in our region than it does in its native habitat, which is 
uh, southwestern Australia because of the, uh, the uh, rainfall rate here is much, much higher than you would have found in its native habitat in Australia. But also because the soil in here is generally very moist, um, these trees are susceptible to a, a root fungus, which is actually attacking each of the trees in this grove. And so over the last several decades, they've either toppled on their own, which is dramatic, or we've taken them out preemptively um, as a way to mitigate uh, risk and falling. So I wanna share some exciting news. And if you follow me over here, we're gonna walk over to um, now the North Fork of Strawberry Creek. One of the, um, the highlights of my position here on campus is also getting to um, be involved in projects where we can do an actual restoration of the creek channel itself. Um, you know, planting is a wonderful thing. Controlling invasive species is a wonderful thing, but it truly gives me a great deal of pleasure when we can take a section of the creek that has um, suffered from the human intervention and we can make it natural again. And so um, here, what I'm going to show you is this is where the North Fork of Strawberry Creek comes out into the eucalyptus grove. Um, this is a very old uh, intervention that the campus did, probably dating back 60 or more years. And um, what you have here is you've got what's known as a wing wall. And coming out right here is a culvert. It actually extends up beyond where we're talking. But you can see that it's already starting to come apart. This was a very hastily put together piece of concrete and some broken pieces of paving on both sides of the creek. And in fact, we know that what's known as the right bank where that ivy is cascading over, it's being undermined uh, right now. And so the campus has set aside some money uh, for this coming year to completely rebuild this area. And we're going to use a rebuild technique that incorporates natural materials. There's a concept for bank uh, reinforcement known as uh, installing a crib wall. And we're gonna use logs that are stacked kind of like the old, uh, the old days, uh, Lincoln logs. And we're going to um, pull this bank back here and then we'll plant the spaces between the logs with native plants and trees. Unfortunately, we're probably gonna lose these little buckeyes here, but we're gonna bring back a number of trees that would be that we typically would have found here um, in doing that job. And then the whole area will be cleared of all this ivy. This is an area of the, of the campus that we haven't touched yet in terms of ivy, but this will all be pulled back and this whole area will be planted with a native palette of um, blackberry and strawberry, uh, which is the namesake of this creek. In addition to uh, replacing this and stabilizing this opposite bank here, we're going to create pool habitat. So while this is a pretty nice deep pool here right now, we know we have fish in it, we're gonna extend this pool habitat down in a series of what they call step pools. It'll be a cascade um, that will actually make its way beyond here down to the confluence. And so that's the kind of thing that uh, going forward that we hope to continue doing on campus is to removing some of the hardscape and some of the old uh, grade control structures and replace them with a more natural setting and thereby um, restore some of the hydrologic function of the creek as well as creating habitat. We have a question if the buckeyes can be transplanted. You know, um, we haven't had a lot of success trying to transplant trees um, this, this big or even bigger. The roots uh, are just generally damaged too much. The good news is, um, and I don't say this lightly, but buckeyes are easy to grow on this campus. Uh, we have a lot of seed material and these trees right here, just based on my own memory, are only probably about five or six years old at most. And so in terms of the lifetime of a buckeye tree, that's pretty brief. We might be able to keep that little bay that's just beyond, but I was just reviewing the um, drawing set for this project and it looks like we might have to actually pull up a little bit in there too. We always will try to save native trees when we do this kind of work if we can, but I rest assured we'll be bringing in not just more buckeyes, but we also have plans to bring in a couple more big leaf maples to drop those beautiful leaves in the creek, as well as a couple of trees which are underrepresented here on campus 
We're gonna be bringing in a couple of red alders, which probably were endemic to this watershed. And then um, some box elders, which are related, uh, same family as the big leaf maples. So I'm really looking forward to this project. We are uh, hoping to start this, uh, the construction phase sometime around June or so. And uh, to do so, we'll, um, we'll probably have to divert the flow for a little while while we uh, do the channel work. Chris is showing me, uh, I just wanna do a little promotion here for you. This was a pamphlet actually that you can use as a self-guided tour for Strawberry Creek. It talks a lot about um, the kind of things that I've been talking about. And uh, you can download a copy of this as a PDF. We're actually not printing it anymore. We're kind of going paperless. Um, but that gives me a chance to plug the uh, Strawberry Creek website. If you go to creeks.berkeley.edu, you'll find a whole lot of information. Uh, it'll be a lot about what I just talked about, um, including this pamphlet. There's another self-guided tour that um, I put together with some of my students about the stormwater uh, program here on campus and how we're trying to uh, restore some of the, the hydrologic function by removing impervious surfaces, by, by um, utilizing the storm water that used to go into a pipe and spreading it out. Uh, um, one thing I always like to remind my students is, always remember the uh, three S's of storm water, slow it, spread it, sink it. And so we have a whole nother guided tour that you can take that just talks about storm water in the built environment. So um, definitely check out uh, creeks.berkeley.edu. And um, uh, we're looking forward to some great things on campus about um, restoring that function and bringing back a lot of habitat. It's really the best part of my job. How can people be helpful? Oh yes, yeah. so how, if you wanna get involved, if you live in the area, um, when we start to reopen after, um, you know, we emerge from this pandemic and the shutdown, um, we will have, we generally have regular volunteer uh, efforts on campus where we will, you know, gather, you know, in groups as large as 50. When we were doing that ivy removal, we have some very large groups up here. Um, so I'm always looking for volunteers. You can uh, send me an email through the website and uh, we'll put you on a listserv. Um, also, we, uh, we encourage you, if you don't live in our area, you know, uh, watershed groups are, are a, a wonderfully burgeoning um, phenomena in, in our day and age, especially in the Bay Area. Um, but find out if there's a volunteer group in your own watershed, uh, as you discover, um, you know, in the area where you live, because not just Strawberry Creek, but watersheds to the south of us, like Sossel Creek, has a very vibrant um, watershed group. Here in our own area, we work a lot with Friends of Five Creeks um, to do amazing work on Cerrito Creek and um, Cal students um, often go out and do <laughs> volunteer work off of campus. So it's a little bit of a competition for, my, for our students you know, to do this kind of work. Um, and if you yourself you know, are a person that is interested in this kind of thing, um, Certainly, you can reach out to me. Uh, my email is public on the directory and uh, send me an email asking anything uh, about organizing these kinds of things, uh, plant selection, all of those things I'm happy to discuss. Thanks. Great talking to you all. <laughs> That's just about to complete our program for the Strawberry Creek Walk. We're going to end with a poem from the Turk again. Uh, this part completes our Strawberry Creek Walk, and we're going to end the poem, uh, end the walk with a poem by Kirk Lumpkin. There he is. So this poem um, includes a a a brief but uh, deeply respectful nod to uh, Gary Snyder and his poem "Song of the Taste." And I'd like to dedicate it to the Ecology Center, which for more than 20 years has co-sponsored our festival and to their Saturday Berkeley Farmers Market, which has been for all those years, our event neighbor. Um, this is called Grace. Oh, also I wanted to mention that while the 
Watershed Environmental Poetry Festival is celebrating its 25th anniversary. The Ecology Center is celebrating its 50th anniversary. And congratulations to all on anniversaries. Again, Grace, this meal, however meager or sumptuous, is the body of the beloved, broken for us, undressed and then redressed in a grateful garment of spices, seasonings of the seasons, salt of the earth from the tears of our mother. When fully prepared and on our tongues, it's a song of taste and nourishment. Here we begin to transform the deaths of our fellow beings, plant and animal into our life. Thankfulness now for the moments we are guests at the great feast until back at the bottom of the great chain, we too become food for everything else. And two very quick pieces. One, it's so short it doesn't even have a title. It is autumn in the empire. And one day in winter, it will fall. And then a very new poem called Here. The names of flamboyant, notorious leaders with their trumped up self importance may, remember, may be remembered long after most of us, but hold on to and nourish all that leads by living example, courageous love, compassion, intelligence, persistent caring, gratitude for the whole interrelated web of life. So those that come after us might inherit an inner compass, able to hold community together as it guides them through the perilous burning darkness ahead back to these places we've called home, but have barely truly known, where the final test of survival will be learning to find sustained sustenance here in our local watersheds, here with no place else to go, here to survive, we will need to Re-indigenize. That concludes, that concludes our uh, Strawberry Creek Walk. And again, it's the uh, Watershed Poetry Festival, the 25th uh, anniversary of it. And if you want to see what else is happening on tonight and also tomorrow, go to poetryflash.org and click on the banner at the top, Watershed, and it will tell you everything. And as we, just before I leave, here is a quick one for you. Two wren tits rustle up toy on red berry feast. Too shy for seeing, flee. Thank you so much for being here.